Roberta Morano, who is this year's Oman Research Fellow, generously sponsored by the Sultan Qaboos Higher Center for Culture and Science. Her talk will be on national identity building and the question of language in modern Oman. And in it, she will appraise the way in which the late Sultan Qaboos emphasized the importance of language in the establishment of a modern national identity. Uh, Dr. Morano holds a PhD in linguistics and phonetics from the University of Leeds, where she also holds a research fellowship. Her PhD was on the Arabic dialect spoken in the Al Awabi district of Northern Oman. And the thesis is actually just about to appear, I mean, basically tomorrow or the day after, inshallah, um, under the title Karl Reinhardt, a century later, diachronic variation in the Omani Arabic vernacular of the Al Awabi district with Cambridge Open Publishers. And this already shows the kind of historical interest and wider contextual, uh, also sociolinguistic interest, which Roberta ha has, and which is evident in some of the articles she has been publishing, such as, for example, um, the threat of climate change on the languages of Southern Arabia. She has, however, also published, how should I say, probably very mainstream um, linguistic articles, such as on the evolving Omani lexicon or the functions and uses of active and passive particle forms in the vernacular of Al Awabi. Um, she has also investigated the linguistic um, consequences of the trans regional entanglements of the seafaring nation of Oman. And these are the kinds of interests and links which really connect her work um, as a linguist with the perhaps more socially, historically um, oriented work at ZMO. And we are very happy that we had this chance, uh, this too brief chance, I should say, of welcoming Roberta at ZMO because she's going to leave us very soon now, sadly. I would like to announce that this lecture is being recorded, however, only the lecture, not the discussion, so um, that nobody feels inhibited. I will now hand over to Roberta, very welcome, and I'll completely disappear from the screen in order to be able to watch the lecture myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Freitag. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, yeah, perhaps um, I want to start with some thanks. And I want to thank, of course, the ZMO, who hosted me in this past three months. Um, it's been such a great experience. And I've enjoyed chatting with a lot of people, not just about Oman, uh, but you know, even talk with scholars that are from fields different from mine. And I immensely enjoyed the Omani section of the library. Um, there's a lot of uh, materials, especially materials in Arabic. Um, so it's been just great uh, being able to uh, consult all this material and work with this material. Um, and then my thanks also to the um, Sultan Qaboos uh, High Center for Culture and Science that allowed me, what sponsored this research and allowed me to, to stay here, um, enjoy this institution and uh, work on my research and perhaps even enjoy uh, the overall experience in Berlin, which has been, has been great. Um, so today I, I want to focus, um, yeah, as, as Dr. Freider said, I'm a linguist um, by training, so I've been working in the past 12 years on the uh, Omani Arabic variety spoken in northern Oman, specifically in the district of Al-Awabi, which is near Ristak um, in the Al-Ajr mountain chain. And um, I've been interested in uh, collecting especially lexical material, so uh, looking at language contact, language variation in Northern Oman. But today I want to focus on the analysis of the national building and identity building process that started in Oman in 1970 during the Renaissance with Sultan Qaboos bin Said. 
um, and put a bit this um, these two processes in the um, perspective of the question of language in Oman. Um, Take a second, try to, yeah. So, no, too far? Yes. Um, so, what I want to, what I hope to be able to talk you through um, is um, a bit of a very brief sketch of the linguistic landscapes of Oman, just to um, give you a bit of an idea uh, for whoever of you is not um, familiar with the context of um, Omani dialects um, and then go straight to the core of the argument. So what is Omanity? Um, how the um, uh, sense of belonging changed before and after 1970? And then analyze the um, Renaissance era. So the themes of the nation building and identity building process through the analysis of the um, narrative, the Renaissance narrative. And I will look a bit at the education policies and process of humanization and the role of the Mani diaspora into the, um, in all the, the building process. And finally, my last point is the question of language within the context of humanity. Um, so we'll talk you through some social attitudes um, towards Omani Arabic and some example of linguistic variation in, in Omani Arabic. Yes, so language identity and society are tightly interconnected. Uh, the Oxford English, English Dictionary um, defines identity as the characteristics determining who or what a person or thing is and distinguishing them for, uh, from others. There's also an hypothesis in sociolinguistics called the sabir Worf hypothesis, which basically states that the structure of a language determines a native speaker's perception and categorization of experience. This is to say that um, we use language and specific linguistic structures to express our beliefs, uh, our experience, our vision of the world and our identity. The languages we speak are part of who we are and define ourselves. And also language is intrinsic to the expression of culture and therefore of one's identity. So it is vital to preserve languages from disappearing or becoming obsolescent. But I'm not just talking about big languages. I'm talking also about local indigenous vernaculars. And dialect death or homogenization is actually um, often the result of social attitudes and language policies that negatively impact on the perception of speakers of these dialects. Um, and is a part, is a phenomenon that is part of the linguistic homogenization of the world, which will eventually bring regional varieties to disappear in favor of more mainstream or prestigious languages. Nevertheless, language change constantly. And it is because we use them to express our beliefs and our um, view of the world it, pass, it changes with the passing of the generation. It is live material that evolves with us and evolves with the world. So it is not unusual for languages to change. That's not the point here. The, in the context of Oman, though, this change is happening quite, um, quite rapidly, more rapidly than one would expect. And there are several reasons for this. There is more recent, more recent reasons are, for example, uh, a process called Gulfinization, which is an homogenized, standardized version of Gulf Arabic. This extract that you can see on the slide is from the website gulfarabic.com. And at the question, what is Gulf Arabic? It says, is the Arabic language variant spoken by the locals of the Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, part of Eastern Saudi Arabia, most of Southern Iraq, and, and this is key, to a lesser extent, Oman. So 
Gulf Arabic is not the native language of any of the Gulf states, but it is a sort of um, variety of Arabic that is used for communica everyday communication in the Gulf region. So far, Oman has been less impacted by this process of Gulfinization for several reasons, which um, some of which I will detail in the course of this lecture. But this is actually changing quite rapidly now. There is a, an interesting study by a master's student at University of Edinburgh that published, a, well, a thesis is not published, but um, is, um, was awarded in 2011. And in this um, study, this study is actually a clear example of how uh, Omani radio broadcasters tend to switch to Gulf Arabic phonological bar um, variants when on air, but then when not on air, so with, with, with friends or family or um, in, in, in a contest that is not the broadcast uh, uh, situation, then they would use Omani Arabic um, uh, traits. But another cause, perhaps a bit less recent, is the opening of the country in the 70s to the outside world um, and some social attitudes that I'm arguing probably were born from the Renaissance ideology. And my argument here is that if on the one hand the Omani Renaissance narrative created in 1970 um, to help building the new nation and the new shared identities for Omani helped in a way bridging over the fragmentation, ethno-linguistic fragmentation of early Omani society. On the other hand, it implicitly caused the rapid loss of specific local and indigenous linguistic traits. Caused a sort of, through, through a process of leveling and standardization of Omani Arabic, which is usually the variant, um, the variety of Arabic spoken in Muscat. So it's the Muscat Arabic. Um, in this slide, you can see this is a map from Ethnologue, um, and the linguistic diversity hosted by the Sultanate of Oman is unprecedented in the Arabian Peninsula. There are 12 languages that are spoken in the country as main languages. So we have, for example, uh, Indo-European sort of Persian origin, Kumzari or Balushi. And then we have Lawati, Zajali, Gujarati. We have Swahili, of course, in the area of Muscat. Uh, we have English, Gulf Arabic that I just mentioned. And whoop, yeah. Um, interestingly, is the group of modern South Arabian languages, which are spoken in so far. Um, and they are um, independent um, group of languages which are all at some degree endangered. Um, and it is interesting that in Zafar, people like, born and, and bred in Zafar usually speak one of these modern South Arabian languages as native language. And then they have to learn Arabic in, in a second, um, I mean, later on in life to, to go to school through school and education. And then, of course, we have what is called Omani Arabic, but Omani Arabic is really includes really a plethora of uh, varieties um, that um, really are spread all over the country from north to south, and each one of them actually displays very specific linguistic traits um, that are um, make different from one another. Um, in the uh, Arabic dialectology field, usually Omani Arabic in general is classified as a separate entity from other uh, varieties spoken in the Gulf. Um, and they are usually deemed to be linguistically more conservative and archaic um, in, if compared to other varieties in the peninsula. It is not a secret that the Arabian Peninsula, if compared, for example, to North Africa, um, displays linguistic features that have completely disappeared in non-Arabian Arabic dialects. And among these countries, Oman actually hold, held on its own linguistic features far longer than the others. 
And there are several reasons for this. If you look here at this couple of maps of Oman, you will see that geographically speaking, the country is almost like an island. So the Sultanate is surrounded by the Indian Ocean for three quarters. Um, the interior is partly isolated from and cut off from the rest of the uh, peninsula by the Halajar mountain chain, which starts from Ras Musandam and ends in Ras Al Had. And then, of course, we have the desert of the Rubal Khali, the empty quarter, and the Jidati Lararis, which really divides north and south. In fact, Zofar is um, uh, linguistically and ethnically closer to Yemen than it is to northern Oman. Um, so the geography of the country, together with social and political situation prior to 1970, are the main reasons why Omani Arabic dialects are still this um, conservative and uh, retain most of these conservative and archaic features. So what is Omanity? Um, Oman had the quite strong sense of identity even before the advent of Islam. Um, the Oman's presence in history dates back to the third millennium before current era, and there's definitely evidence of human presence in Oman during the Stone Age, so it's quite an important part. Um, but Omanis were known to be expert seafarers, merchants, um, shipbuilders. Um, they were the first one to know how to navigate with the monsoon winds. And thanks to his strategic position in, um, at the center of the Arabian Sea and between the major trade routes of the Indian Ocean, Oman became a significant hub in the area. You can see in these pictures, that's the major trade routes um, in, in, the, in the area. Um, they're shipbuilders, and this is a, an, a nice picture of the frankincense route, so where frankincense was departing from Oman and then be sold um, worldwide. Soon after the advent of Islam, though, in the seventh century, uh, Oman became refuge for Kharijit and Ibadis, who were fleeing from the caliphates who were establishing after the death of the prophet. Um, and this split soon transformed in uh, imamat. Now, the history of the imamat, I'm not getting into details here because it's been um, it's been talked about in several scholars analyze the history of the imamat. Um, I'm only really mentioning here because the the institution of the imamat um, in a way that survived until 1950s. So we're talking about quite a big and long history. Um, it is part of what was Omanity before 1970 and this inherent dichotomy that Oman really witnessed. So on the one hand, we have the imamat, um, very traditional in interior with Nizwa's capital, uh, quite isolated. And on the other hand, we have Muscat, we have uh, the trades, the merchants, the maritime power, the shipbuilder, the shipbuilding cities and so on. And this duality um, actually carried quite a significant and historical uh, aftermath. Um, the SIP agreement, which was signed in 1920, the factor recognized the autonomy of the imamat, even if not politically, it basically completely isolated it in the interior of the country. And there was this big split between Muscat and Oman. Um, Mark Valery, who has uh, extensively worked on the politics of Oman, calls the 50s and 60s the um, decades of remoteness, and actually for a good reason, because at this point in time, Oman had no infrastructure, no form of education, primitive healthcare, numerous expatriates that were working for the oil companies. Uh, oil was discovered in Oman in the 30s. Um, no diplomatic relations and no international network. So 
As one can imagine, the only possible outcome of such a situation was economic and social stagnation. And a lot of wealthy Omanis, the Omanis who could afford it, just left the country to move, uh, to move abroad. And this started one of the biggest displacement in the history of Oman. So with the impossibility of communicating among themselves because of no infrastructure or paved roads, um, Omanis were actually isolated and fragmented. So they prefer to play allegiance to local sheikhs rather than the Sultan. Sometimes they didn't even know what the, 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 the Sultan face was. Um, but linguistically speaking, this was what saved in a way, um, Omani Arabic vernaculars from the influence of other forms of Arabic, Omani and not. Um, so this situation, the political situation that I've just briefly described, the geography of the country that I mentioned at the beginning, is what preserved local Omani dialects for such a long time. So the years after 1970, when Sultan Qaboos came to power, um, are known in the literature as the Renaissance era, is the, the Omani Renaissance, um, and, uh, or Omani Nahda. The, the word um, Nahda is often associated with a social and political sort of awakening or rebirth. The word itself means the process of getting better, the act you know, of going up, of, of rising. And in itself really carries a sort of um, contrast value. So it's getting better from a situation that was bad. And the Renaissance narrative is central to the nation and to the identity building process in the new Oman. Since the very beginning, Sultan Qaboos pledged to build a modern nation, positioning it within the international context of the peninsula, but also the global uh, world. And there are, I, I, I've singled out five main themes of the Renaissance narrative that in a way explain, uh, support my argument. And these are the use of a binary terminology. So we, uh, I mentioned this contrast value that it's given even with the word Nahda, so calling Omani Nahda, Omani Renaissance, the period um, after the 1970. And the binary terminology to emphasize this contrast is constant in the royal speeches and all um, uh, uh, official uh, document, documents. So you have light, darkness, backwardness, modernity, uh, peace, conflict, wealth, poverty. The second theme is unity. So one name, um, one language, one country. Omani heritage and the glorious past of Oman, uh, Omani traditions, the Sultan Qaboos persona and human capital. I'm gonna um, analyze this theme one by one. Um, but it's interesting that in a survey I undertook while I was last in the field in 2018, I've asked uh, the, the family I was living with and the participants of, of my uh, linguistic study what humanity meant for them. So what really, what are the, 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 the in your opinion, the distinctive traits that define humanity. So what makes Oman, Oman? And uh, the answers I received were quite interesting. Um, so a few of them said tolerance and modesty as the main characteristics of, well, the, the, Omani, um, the Omani character. And then we have heritage and tradition. And then not really surprisingly, in first place, we have Sultan Qaboos with 75%. Um, and it is not a coincidence that most of these are actually the themes, well, part of the themes of the Renaissance um, narrative that I will illustrate um, now. So the first one, um, 
a binary terminology. I've, um, I've put here a few ex extracts from uh, royal speeches and I, I put in bold the, the keywords here of this binary terminology. So you have darkness. The, the first extract is from the very first speech, uh, 23rd July, 1970. And it says, my people, my brothers, yesterday it was complete darkness. And with the help of God, tomorrow will be a new dawn on Muscat, Oman and its people. So here you have light and darkness. Um, but as you can see, there's new sun, dawn, renaissance, a new age, um, and then a constant reminder of the situation Oman was living in, in before 1970. So isolationism and stagnation. And you will see even in the, I put for a few more um, extracts from royal speeches, even related to the other themes, but this binary terminology will be quite recurrent. So um, in terms of unity, one of the first thing that uh, Sultan Qaboos did um, in uh, the announced in 1970 on a radio broadcast, um, the new name of the country. So from Sultanate of Muscat and Oman to Sultanate of Oman. So Muscat and Oman, the, the name Sultanate of Muscat and Oman relates to that imamat uh, institution that I mentioned at the beginning. So two separate entities, um, although not really politically autonomous, but still very distinctive. Um, whereas, of course, Sultanate of Oman was to embrace the, the whole of the population. Um, and then, yes, so new name, a new flag. Um, the flag uh, that you have on the right is um, the Omani Empire flag. So you have plain red with the Hanjar and the Shimitars. Uh, and the new flag is um, kept the, the Hanjar, which is symbol of Omani strength and glorious past. And then you, we have the red, which is the symbol of the battles fought um, by the Omani people throughout the history, the white, uh, hope and peace, and then the green is the green lands of Oman, so uh, Jabal Akhtar and uh, all the Zofari land. Um, but more importantly, in terms of unity, um, it was the unity within the Omani people. And the Renaissance narrative emphasized two main values that are sharing responsibility and teamwork. So I've put here a few more extracts. And again, I've put in bold the keywords. You have cooperation, one body. Actually, this is interesting. It says the government and the people are as one body. If one of its limbs fail to do its duty, the other parts of the body will suffer. So government and people are one thing. Um, and more importantly, the, 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 the team of unity is vital to the Renaissance narrative because change can only be achieved if its actors, in this case, the Omani people, has maximum consciousness of the needs and the hopes of the Omani society. And Omanis need to acknowledge the fact that their participation into Omani social and political development is pivotal because during Said bin Taimur's reign, people did not really have any say in the political or social matters, and life was often miserable. And this, of course, sharpened all the fragmentation of the Omani society before 1970. Um, but now Omanis must play their part, um, must work together among themselves and with the government to enjoy a new era and a prosperous life. And one thing that uh, Caboose started, which was um, key in this themes of sharing responsibility, was the royal tours um, that the Sultan took, um, undertook yearly. And in these royal tours, the Sultan was traveling with a group of ministers and um, it was basically uh, talking with representatives from cities and villages uh, in public gatherings. So 
these people would have, um, you know, he would have listened to his uh, issues and proposals and ideas and then give um, instructions to his ministers accordingly. So that was big um, novelty, a big change. The third theme is heritage and tradition. Um, this image that you can see in the, on the slide is from one of the first pamphlets um, uh, printed in the early 70s. And the image clearly shows, well, it says New Oman, and then uh, shows an old man uh, with the dish dasha um, and the, 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 the Omani attire and uh, a young boy with a khanjar. Um, and it's a clear depiction of the new Oman, so old and new that goes together. Um, in these extracts, again, uh, just um, uh, I, I, I highlighted the keywords, so past glories, past civilization. And in the last extract, you can see, uh, it says, this is because here in Oman, our supreme characteristics is still modesty, as taught by our Islamic religion. So again, that modesty that we saw coming out in the survey as one of the characteristics of Omani and Oman. And the glorious past that these uh, royal speeches extras talk about is um, the same past embedded, for example, in the national museums of Oman. So you have maritime power, seafaring, trades, handicrafts. Um, the Yarubi dynasty, for example, which is the dynasty who started the, um, uh, you know, the, the expansion of Oman into East Africa and everything that sort of emphasized the translocal identity of Oman. And of Oman, uh, uh, Omani tradition also means, for example, uh, standardization of the dress code. So men usually wear this white ishtasha in formal occasion. Uh, women um, usually went out, wears a black abaya, but there's a, a plenty of traditional dresses um, from individual governorates, for example, uh, but also architecture. So buildings can only be a certain height um, and just certain colors, beige and white usually. Um, in 1976 was also established the Ministry of National Heritage and Culture, which was the, the, whose initial program wanted to sort of enhance, encourage the um, handicrafts production, especially in the remote villages um, of Oman, with the hope also that people wouldn't leave the villages to move to the big city, would just stay there and, you know, just thrive there. So I guess this is a, quite an interesting point of Omani, of the new Omani identity, because it's still what characterized Oman today. If, when you go to Oman as a tourist, you will have the feeling of being have that sort of traditional Arab society feeling, but at the same time is a modern and developed country. And I guess the key here is that Omanis had the ability not to sell their Arab and Islamic uh, identity, but even more locally proper Omani identity. Um, and values to the corruption of costumes for just the sake of progress and, uh, and modernity. So that was a key point as well. Um, Sultan Qaboos, um, yes, so, uh, is often, was often called the father of the nation, is still called the father of the nation. Um, and uh, he, he is the personification of the new Oman because um represents that entanglement between old and new he was born in salala from a sunny zofari woman and ibadi sultan spends most of his younger years abroad um, he studies in the uk he moved to germany with the scottish cameroonian regiment and then went for a grand tour of the world before returning to oman um, and soon after the deposition of his father in, uh, on July 23rd, 1970, the new Sultan became almost like the object of a personality cult. And there's an interesting article 
uh, by Phillips and Hunt um, that, and they reported during their field work, whenever they were asking people, um, try to understand how Oman, Oman managed to develop this fast. And um, the idea that without Sultan Qaboos, we would be Yemen was offered to them um, by basically all Omanis that were trying to explain the national development. And the narrative, the Renaissance narrative, actually credits all the national development to, to the new ruler, to Sultan Qaboos, and is continuously echoed in all official information and royal speeches. So the first extract here you see is from a, um, a pamphlet of the Ministry of Information published in 2005. And it basically says that Oman's leadership is encapsulated in the thought and person of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos bin Said. During whose reign, the Sultanate has embarked upon an era of unprecedented prosperity, security, and progress. Um, and this is achieved also through that contrast that we saw at the beginning between Kabu's time, Kabu's era, and um, his father's reign before. Um, in fact, I've heard numerous stories of uh, Sultan Said bin Taymur's obsessive rules and regulation. People still talk about it. It's passed into folklore almost. Um, so Kabus is the savior, is um, only him with his education, his foresight, his insightfulness could give Omanis the freedom they deserved. And one strong evidence of this is the change of the national day, which the first year was celebrated on July 23rd, which is the day uh, of the official date of ascension to the throne, and then moved to November 18th, which is uh, Sultan Kabu's birthday. Um, last theme is uh, the human capital. So Sultan Kabu's new, um, well, the, the, the Renaissance narrative, what, what the Renaissance narrative is built on is how important was the human capital, which is Omani people. And I've already mentioned the, 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 import of, the importance of instilling into Omanis the idea that, um, you know, the, 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 sh the teamwork, the shared responsibility um, to build, how fundamental was their role in building the new nation. Um, but in terms of human capital, I want to briefly talk about also the the role of the Omani diaspora into all this nation building process and some uh, education policies. Um, if you see the extracts just um, below Omani diaspora, I said, we invite those of you who have lost their Omani nationality to return to the lines of unity in the Sultanate of Oman. So again, we have this idea of, of unity, of one people, we all need to be in this together and um, work towards this together. And one of the first action by Sultan Qaboos was to declare a general amnesty for previous opposers of the government. These are mainly the followers of the, the imamat I mentioned before, they fled to Saudi Arabia. But under the broad umbrella of Omani diaspora, we don't only have enemies of previous government. We also have those wealthy Omanis that fled the country to avoid uh, social hardship in the 50s and 60s. Um, by the late 60s, there were around 50,000 Omanis in Gulf states. And then, of course, we also have um, a group of people that were recalled to a homeland where they never stepped foot before, namely all the Zanzibari Omanis. Um, in fact, though, the Omani diaspora actually played quite a vital role in the nation building process because most of them were much more educa scholarly educated than the Omanis who remained in the country. Um, the new arrivals brought professional experience in administration, in banking, in other technical fields. If we think that Zanzibar had, was second just to Egypt, um, in terms of um, uh, education uh, levels in Africa at that time. So there was a, a fresh influx of educated people into the Omani new administrative machine. But education was key. 
education is was and is the perfect means for the renaissance well for, for the government to channel the national identity narrative and this renaissance narrative but at the same time bridge over the ethno-linguistic diversity that um were existing in oman um, I mentioned Zofar briefly before, where people usually are native speakers of one of these modern South Arabian languages, and they have to learn Arabic just at, at, as a second stage. The new education policies were aiming at, strength, at strengthening the shared identity of Omanis, but at the same time, um, going, you know, uh, this identity outside the linguistic or religious affiliation on the totality of the Sultanate's territory. Um, and one of the major differences between Sultan Qaboos and his father was the um, attitude towards education. So if um, Said bin Taymur considered a Western style education a dangerous precedent for his country, Sultan Qaboos, on the other hand, actually saw it as a, a political opportunity because educated, informed people would have been much keener to participate in the nation building process um, and in, in the political and social sphere more generally. Um, and the importance of um, education, actually, you could see I've uh, underlined in here is the important thing is that there should be education even under the shed of trees. Of trees. So education was key, 100% key. And this point, uh, which I'm not going to read aloud, is from the National Statistic Department and the Ministry of Development. And they basically um, sum up the, the, the aims, the objectives of education. The one I want to direct your attention to is uh, point two, where you have, again, national unity and the Omani national character. So you have this tradition um, Omani heritage, and then, of course, the, the one nation, one people. Uh, and mass education has an enormous impact on the development of human capital and national cohesion in general. Um, because this creates a homogeneous system of values and sense of belonging, um, which was the point of the Renaissance uh, ideology. Um, so before 1970, the Sultanate counted only three Western type of school and about 50 Quranic school. Uh, Omanis who could afford it were sending their children to study abroad in, in Europe or other Gulf states in the States. Um, but with Sultan Qaboos, this changed drastically. So between 1970 and 1976, there were at least 200 new schools were built. Uh, in 1986, we have the um, uh, inauguration of the Sultan Qaboos University uh, with no fees and also had free housing for female students. Um, but there was also the, the aim of eradicating illiteracy because with three schools, people were almost completely literate before 1970. So, Illiteracy levels went from 41% in the early 90s to 14% to 2010, and I'm sure now it's even less. Um, but at the beginning of this education, mass education process, Oman did not, didn't have uh, skilled and qualified teachers to, to, to teach, so they imported them from other Arab countries, mainly Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia, Sudan. And to solve the problem within the borders, then in 1976, Oman launched a teacher training program. Um, in 1997, um, it was like, after that, there was basically reform after reform to have the best possible education system. Um, and in terms of language, which is what I'm most interested in, the education system usually employed uh, modern standard Arabic and English. Uh, because it was vital for the population to, for the whole population to be able to speak Arabic, um, so that 
the, the nation could develop and that they could have reached by the Renaissance narrative. And um, this, of course, entailed that local dialects, especially in the interior of Oman, the same sort of feature that I gave you at the beginning, um, tended to uh, become labeled as archaic and viewed with condescension by younger generation. Um, and that now in, at a stage where they are threatened, some of these are threatened to disappear in favor of a more standardized version of Omani Arabic, which is usually, as I said, the one spoken in Muscat um, or modern standard. Um, Arabic language teaching is seen in Oman as a tool for instilling sense of belonging and citizenship to the country, but also to its more broadly Arab Islamic identity. Um, the first few textbooks and syllabus were coming from Qatar and Kuwait. Um, and up until 1975, the overall education system was really droning upon other Arab countries, because as I said, Oman did not have qualified teachers at that stage. Um, so Arabic language in a way, um, teaching, contributed to melting down all these sociolinguistic and sociocultural differences um, and divisions that were in Oman prior to 1970. And language te teaching is often a very powerful instrument to unify an otherwise diverse population like multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual society. And then on top of this, I mean, it, alongside Arabic, then we have English, who was introduced in 1970, because English was recognized as the language of national development and modernization to, that would have helped Oman, well, would have enhanced the chances of Oman to, you know, meet global challenges and regain their place on the international scene. Um, but the language planning situation in the Sultanas only goes in so far English and Arabic. So all the minority languages and uh, local vernaculars are left unplanned. Um, and this is because generally, but not only in Oman, uh, despite their quite substantial differences in some cases, Arabic dialects are still classified as variation of the same language, so Arabic, because their differences are often lexical, phonological, but not really structural, so it's still Arabic. Um, I'm conscious of time and I'm basically done. Um, the, humanization, the humanization program is um, something that is still going on in Oman now. It's mainly, it looks mainly at um, uh, the job market, but also, well, it, it had an impact on the education as well. The same, uh, the, the, the young generation had to be taught about, you know, money values, money heritage, the same uh, values and themes that we already saw. Um, so I'm, I'm almost basically done. Um, I've put in here just uh, very briefly um, that this, the, the, what happened though was that there was, uh, as the result of this, all this picture that I gave you, basically social attitudes towards Omani Arabic have often stigmatized the local vernaculars uh, locally and regionally. These two examples are from two cartoon TV series. The first one, Shabiyat al Khartoum, this one, um, is um, Emirati, so it um, was broadcasted in 2006 and is defined as a social comedy tackling the problems of the Gulf uh, through the lives of people from different cultures living in Dubai. And in this um, cartoon, which was uh, mentioned in that study in the sociological, sorry, in the sociolinguistic study that I mentioned at the beginning from Al Nabani, uh, the uh, Edinburgh student. Um, there is a couple, an Omani couple, um, and they are depicted as low class and their dialect is emphasized for comedy purposes. Uh, so there's quite a lot of stigmatization in that sense. The second one is a bit older, 2000-2002, um, uh, or 
uh, Block 13 is basically the Kuwaiti adaptation of the American South Park. And uh, again, here you have um, an Omani character who spoke in the exaggerated form of Omani Arabic, again, for comedy effect. Um, and in, in this sociolinguistic study on the radio broadcasters that I mentioned at the beginning, Nabani found that most of Omanis were actually self-conscious of their dialect and how their dialect is stigmatized in, in the Gulf area. Um, but despite this linguistic insecurity, she also found that the new generation of Omanis were actually much keener to represent their Omani identity also linguistically instead of denying it. And here we have two examples of Omani produced and acted um, TV series. Um, one um, is the older one, 2011, Yomu Yom, Yom um, is defined as the first multi-dialectal Omani 3D cartoon. And you have a lot of this, all Omani characters speaking in different Omani vernacular. So you have Dakhliya, you have Batina, you have Sharkia, and so on. And then the latest one is Tawasil in 2018. They actually won also quite a lot of prizes. Um, and uh, yeah, it depicts the adventure of Abu Maimuna and Hamouds in the city of Muscat. Um, so that said, though, I'm not going to get through to this. This is just a bunch of lexical data I've collected during my field work. But this is to show that lexically, there's starting to be quite a lot of difference between even like a span of one generation. So I worked with older speakers that were like 60 plus. You can never really be sure too much about the age of people after born before 1970 because the registration of birth started after. But um, I mean, they, they, they would know if it was before or after Sultan Qaboos and then um, adult, adult and younger speakers. And there's a lot of this um, lexicon that is actually disappearing. And I remember the example of Hest, which is used by older people to mean very many instead of the Omani Wagged. And when I said it, um, I had this list of words and I was working with my informants and I said, Hest, what, what Hest means? the younger and adult speakers would just immediately laugh at me because it sounded like it sounded like very old fashioned to their ear. Um, the younger speakers actually didn't even know what that meant, uh, but the adult speakers um, recognized that as an older um, traits. So for like grandparents sort of generation. Um, and then the cardinal points is just a very example of how even environmental referring nouns are changed in between generation. In the case of uh, cardinal points is also locally, so between Awabi town and Wadibane Harus. And all these, what, what, what I'm trying to show here is that all this is getting obsolescent and disappearing at quite a fast pace. Um, so here we are. Um, I, my argument was that part of the problems, a part, not a problem, but part of the, the, the cause of language change and variation in Oman um, has been the opening of the country and all the education policies and renaissance narrative with all these themes that I mentioned. Um, but, encouragingly, more recent analysis of social attitudes towards Omani vernaculars actually sh show a positive trend to recognize the Omani linguistic diversity um, also related to Arabic dialects. And just to finish, thank you very much. Um, this is a picture of me during Eid in 2018 with a Omani um, dress um, with my family. And that was it. So vielen Dank.